wonder if you think about me like I think of you. Wonder if you dream the way I do. When you look at clouds, do you see faces as I do? Do you get caught by your own thoughts like I do? If I show these words to you, wonder if you laugh at my simple poetry, or even worse, would you look at me with pity in your eyes, saying I'm great, that you would like to be my friend? 'Cause you. We 
Keep taking my time through boxes and lies. We were so good at flying, but we can't keep flying. We keep getting stuck on the wrong side of the mountain. We were so good at trying, but we can't keep trying. Cause we only end up on the wrong side of the mountain. We were so good at flying, but we can't keep flying. We keep getting stuck. Chasing highs, chasing highs. What is love? Lately I've been wondering just what is love? What is love? I don't know. No one ever showed me I've been on my own for too long. But if you hold me now, let me into your heart. Maybe I can start to love again and tend to my scars. Can you show me? And good evening everybody and welcome once again to another live stream here on the Outdoors Station. Well, we're looking forward tonight in a big way. Great guests, lots of good conversation and lots of interesting behind the scenes things coming as well. Uh, I see we've got various people in the chat room. For some reason I can't seem to pull the chat up tonight, so I'm going to have to read it off the screen. 
Uh, but uh, welcome one and all. Welcome watching on the live stream. And of course, welcome people who will be watching the playback and hopefully listening to the podcast. So Tom Sirs is watching from uh, Wokingham in Berkshire. Uh, Paul from Love Audio Production. Nice to see you, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Smoggy Walks again. Good evening from a sunny Brecon Beacons. Yeah, it's uh, sunny in the Mulvins as well, which is really good. Uh, Simon Walsh joining us beer in hand. Terry will uh, approve of that one. And uh, Lake District Guide is uh, here as well. And uh, yeah, well, loads of other people. So that's really good. Now, of course, once again, we do have the lovely Rose in the chat room. Uh, she is uh, overseeing the conversations there and, uh, and joining us uh, where she can. Hi, everyone. Still here. <laughs> And she isn't suffering from uh, from from COVID. She is uh, suffering from hay fever, bless her. So uh, she's she's doing exceedingly well to be here and add her enthusiasm to the evening. So you all know what's happening this evening. This evening we are talking to Terry Abraham, and just a brief introduction. As you all know, Terry is joining us tonight. He's a celebrated filmmaker of the Life of a Mountain trilogy, broadcast on the BBC. Scorfell Pike, Blen Cathra, and Hel Velin all feature in their raw power and glory. And Terry not only captures their character, but also many of those who live amongst their majesty on the slopes, in the villages, and in the fertile valleys. He started some 10 years ago as an enthusiastic wild camper. Uh, video recording his trips and uh, for his for a personal blog and tonight we're going to touch on how this initial passion developed into an award-winning filmmaking career so good evening Terry good evening hope you can uh, hear me loud and clear we've got you we've got you loud and clear sir we've got you loud and clear um, good to uh, good to have you amongst us um, sorry, I've got lots of new buttons to press tonight, so I'm looking in different directions. And uh, as I say, there's uh, quite a few people watching in the in the chat, which is good. So hopefully they shall be joining us as uh, the evening progresses. So much to talk about. Uh, such a fantastic range of films, but there's also loads of stories behind the scenes, I know. And having read your autobiography, um, which I noticed John Manning had a hand in. Who is this John Manning fella? Um, uh, it's, uh, it's good to get some backstory as well. So let's just go back uh, 10 years, or just over 10 years if we could, and you started your, uh, your blog spot then, uh, blogging and showing uh, some of your wild camping trips. Was that your first introduction to wild camping, or had you been building up to that over the years? Uh, no, it wasn't my first. I, I camped out as a teenager. Um, I've always had this connection with the outdoors, thanks to my grandfather, who had a profound influence on me you know he had a he was a farmer had a love for the great art great outdoors and nature and the environment um i should add that he was an immigrant as well you know he, he came he came to britain as a prisoner of war from world war ii so he was a german but i wasn't aware of any of that really as a kid growing up i just saw granddad you know and um, working on the farm and all the rest of it and so we do several overnight stays in woodlands that he was managing and some of it he owned for shoots and stuff pheasant shoots which isn't terribly fashionable nowadays of course for obvious reasons but um you know that's just the way life was and so we do sort of like a lot of bear grills type stuff building shelters and things and um and i i used to spend a lot of my summer holidays the vast majority of my summer holidays as a kid um partly on the, on the farm where he lived, but partly because of troubles I had at home with parents divorcing and stuff like that. And it was kind of an escape and a release for me. And he was only too happy and willing to just let me out the door at 6 a.m. and then see me back for tea time and just doing what I do out in the countryside. Yeah. And so it's always been there. And then it was really sort of in my late 20s that I suddenly realized, hold on a minute, people that actually do something like this for real out in the countryside and albeit with tents and what have you and camp out on the mountains and the moors and all that kind of thing and so um yeah it sort of became an addiction after that really and um, i've not looked back since well it's uh, it's a great way to have a childhood and certainly when you reflect on modern day childhoods you realize how lucky you and we ours were very similar we were to have farms and open spaces and less things to worry about. There's so many things to worry about these days, or parents mm -hmm. end up worrying, perhaps unnecessarily, but it's natural, uh, understandably. 
So, um, again, I say, turning the clock back 10 years, I know that you got to a point with your uh, work, uh, you're working for an IT company or something, and you ended up being made redundant. And that can be quite an emotional time, especially in your early 30s, um, to, to have the rug pulled financially from underneath you. Um, and I believe you were recently married and stuff as well at the time. So it must have been quite an emotional moment, really, to, to make a decision to take the, your interest in the wild camping and also the feedback that you'd had on the videos uh, to mm -hmm. take it a stage further and say, right, I'm going to make a film. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you, you put it rather simply, but like anything in life, it's always complicated. There's lots of greys and whites, varying shades of white, but... Um, yeah, by that point, I was, I was moonlighting at, at weekends, really, producing videos promoting the Peak District National Park for um, Let's Stay Peak District and businesses like that and holiday cottages um, because they'd cottoned on to some of the videos I was doing from the wild camps out on the fells and putting them on YouTube. And <clears throat> that was really born out of my interest in film and obviously the outdoors and videos like that now. You know, people out on wild camps and the fells are to a penny, but... Back then it was, you no know, no one was really doing anything like that. And the te technology was different as well. You know, I was carrying a camera around about this big just to get a few shots and in an amateur way. Um, and I don't mean that in a horrible way because everybody has to start from somewhere. So I started as an amateur and look where I am now. But um, it was born from that and it developed. And then um, I was moonlighting at weekends and stuff like that. And then the redundancy, um, well... You know, I'll make no bones about it. It was it was heartbreaking. Um, I have a very vivid memory of going into the garage where I lived at the time, away from wife and family, and sobbing like a baby because it happened just before Christmas. And I thought, well, what the hell am I going to do now for yeah. helping paying the bills and life and everything else? It was horrible. But at the same time, I had good friends ping me saying, look, you know, this could be the making of you. This could be a lucky break, chase the dream of doing professional videos, promoting the outdoors with what I do. And, um, and that was all down. Thanks really. in most part to people that followed my work and, and enjoyed seeing it. And that encouraged me to develop my skills, skills further and so on and so forth. So I bit the bullet and, and went for it. And, um, I've not, I've not looked back since. So those friends who said that it could be the making of your, it could be a lucky break. Um, they were right in yeah, retrospect. Yeah. <laughs> so I suppose the the support you'd had from the local uh, councils or whoever that were you were doing the moonlighting for really gave you the confidence you were going down the right route. I mean, uh, as you probably know, I've had a freelance career as well, and I know there are times and moments where you just wonder where you're you're raking, you're making the right step or not. Yeah, uh, because yeah. you can get yourself into brown sticky stuff very, very quickly if you're not careful. And certainly, that, you know, yeah. starting a starting a big project like the film that it ended up being. I mean, was it that big a project? And did you really consider the sort of well, I don't know financial ramifications of the commitment you were you were undertaking for that first one? No. Well, first of all, I have to say that I'd never been self-employed in my life, so that was scary. And as you inferred, you never know where your next pay packet is coming in. You have to constantly work and work and work. And you have to think of the bigger picture. What am I likely or could earn months down the line? Or even now, you know, what I do anyway, at least, even now in my current circumstance, what am I doing the year after next and so on and so forth? Because you've got to pay the bills. You know, we're all human beings and whatnot. And, and yes, I'm following a passion, but born out of that, work and effort I did in the Peak District did lead me down onto a path where I thought, you know, I don't want to do promotional videos anymore. I look back at some of them now and I absolutely bloody cringe. Some of them are really cheap <laughs> and nasty, but, but that's life, isn't it? You know, but, and I've had this idea bubbling away that this is, this is my goal. This is my ambition. I wanted to get back to the Lake District, Cumbria in particular, not just the Lake District, but Cumbria, where I feel I have this, spiritual connection and i know lots of people say that but i genuinely mean that and and i thought i want to do a year in the life of skillful pike because one it's one of my favorite areas of the county 
but no narrator, just the natural, authentic voices of people that live there, play there, work there, care for it and everything else, but captured the beauty of the area from a wild campus point of view, which for me was the main mission because yes, you get lots of TV programs that film in the Lake District and other places around the UK, but they never really capture them at their absolute best. And um, so that for me was the germination of it really was born there to this is what I want to do. And I didn't have enough money to do it. I took over two years to produce it. I crowdfunded some of it. Um, I wish to got more money for that, given how long it took me in the end. And, and with sponsors as well, at the time I was working with um, various gear companies like Van Gogh and Rab and this, that, the other. And I pitched the idea to them because I was aware in a naive way that they do contribute funding as sponsorship to independent filmmakers. So I just told them the idea and I said, look, I want to do this film about Skull Foot Pike. It's a year in a life, blah, blah, blah. Are you interested? I'll do something formal in a couple of months and think about it and do a proper pitch and all the you know dots and I's and T's yeah, and TikTok. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't have to do any of that. They just went straight back to me going, how much do you want? We're in. And so yeah. I was just like shocked, nervous and going, it's a thousand pounds. All right. Done. Okay. And again, that was the naivety because it took me over two years. A grand ain't going to get me through two years. And so I did the crowdfunding, everything else. And it was in that period, um, I thought, I need to have a break from this and think about things to try and earn money. And um, that's when I contacted one of my heroes, Chris Townsend, wow. to do yeah, a project yeah, with yeah. So I was going to say, I was going to come on to the, to the association and the project with Chris. It's, it's what I'm hoping to get across really with this conversation tonight and talking, talking with you is explain to people that it looks good now. Now you've achieved the, the uh, impact that you have and the quality and people respect and understand what you've done and so on. But uh, on those early stages, when you're putting a project together, you're sort of sometimes spending half the time trying to convince yourself you can do it and it'll, it'll all come together. Then, as you say, you, you, know, you pitched um, two very supportive companies that thankfully uh, gave you a, a, an immediate um, boost, emotional boost, more, more than financial, I'm sure. Uh, and then you start mm. doing the actual project itself. Um, and, and as you rightly say, then things start to get a bit thin financially. And, you, and it's like, OK, what am I going to do now? And the panic starts to set in, but you still want to keep the quality and the production going as well. So it's a hell of a juggle, and I don't think people really realise some of the stress that, that independent freelancers or filmmakers possibly go are under sometimes when they're trying to put a project together, keeping this professional face going all the time, but actually beneath, mm. beneath the, screen, the scenes, beneath the water, you're paddling like mad just to keep going. Yeah, absolutely, and I can relate to all of that, Bob. I really can, and. And I'm sure that those that are in a similar situation out there will absolutely agree as well. Um, I don't know. I, I just, I just consider myself extremely lucky. You know, um, I achieved something. It was, it was a passion project. It was a dream. You know, um, <coughs> excuse me, putting the Cairngorms video aside that I did with Chris Townsend, which helped me immensely in terms of. Well, I'd never been there before, and I did a video with him called The Cairngorms in Winter. And so that was a baptism of fire um, for anyone that knows the Cairngorms. Um, and I, I drew, see, I, I often say I draw strength from the negatives in life. I don't seek praise, I don't seek positivity. I actually thrive on the negativity or criticism because it encourages me. I suppose it's something to do with my working class you know cancer state roots or something i want i've got that little chip on my shoulder that wants to prove people wrong and so i i draw strength from that and i just carry on and I carry on and carry on hoping that all that passion will shine through and gain something for me some reward but it's not just for me it's it's for the people it's for society it's for those who watch it i always seek to inspire and enlighten and get people to care about places and people and heritage and culture and that that's born from 
you know, the profound influence of my grandparents because my grandfather with his love for the countryside, but my, my grandmother as well, because she came over here as a refugee. She was Russian. And she always drilled into me about learning from history, culture, heritage, people, understand humanity and learn from history and don't repeat the mistakes that we've had to encounter, all the terrible things that they had to encounter with World War Two and so on. So all those stuff, all that stuff really lingers in the back of my mind when I do what I do. So when it goes to Scorfield Pike, that film, that's what drove me on. And to be succinct, try to be at least, because I've had a pint, so I can go on for till the cows come <laughs> home. But it was, I think I had about four months to go to finish the Scorfield film, and I was down to my last 200 quid. And at the time, I was living in Nottinghamshire, and... It cost me just over 100 quid as a return train fare because I don't drive or anything. So I use public transport, walk and all the rest of it. Um, and and I, it was a horrible stormy evening and I had a tough few days while camping up on the fells around the school fells getting shots for the film. And I was in the pub and Eric Robson I became friends with was there. And, you know, locals and stuff eventually got an idea of what I was doing, what I was aiming for with this documentary, even though at that time I had no idea where it was going um, in, in terms of a finished product. And I was a bit down the dumps, soaked to the bone, muddy, looking a bit like a tramp and all that. And Eric was like approaching me like, are you all right, boy, and all this kind of thing. So I'm down to the last 200 quid, mate, and I've got like four months more filming I want to do or I need to do for the documentary. And um, he very kindly bless him, took me to the side and said, I'll give you the money. How much do you want? And I says, I don't know, a grand. I think I could get by on the grand. Right. Well, I says, how am I going to pay you that back when you sell the DVDs? Because I'm telling you, this is going to change your life. And I says, well, I ain't got the money to do DVDs. And it turns out Eric has a business that distributes DVDs and everything else. He says, you can pay me it back out of your royalties. Trust me, this will change your life overnight. And um, he was absolutely right. And so it's not just down to sponsors. It's not just down to the locals. It's not just down to the crowdfunding. It's just that humanity, you know, people that are inspired or care about something. And they had that faith in me. And it still touches me to this day, to be honest. It still makes me want to well up. Not that I'm a, well softy or anything as those who know me very well but it does and um and i'm extremely thankful for it and do you know what he was bloody right it did change my life overnight and um yeah i thank the gods for it i've yeah. not looked back since well uh striding edge uh, com if people want to uh buy your uh videos and other products there just to let people know that's where they can get it from if they're watching this at the moment uh, and all the information is there should you wish to uh, follow through after the watching this conversation um what i was sorry rose what what i was going to say was um yeah poor glove suffering from hay fever she really is <laughs> you get her there with like a hanky or something yeah yeah good. she's there she said don't put the camera on me when i'm blowing my nose and she's sitting there snuffling quietly poor love i do i'm sorry <laughs> one of those moments um when you were in the Cairngorms with Chris, I, I reread your book and picked up on something which I thought was quite a, a, a poignant uh, moment. Um, obviously, the project with Chris was was, aimed, was going to be a great success and is a great success. And, and certainly uh, everything you said about Chris in there, I, I agree with. He's a lovely chap and very, uh, very, very straight. And you don't meet many people like that, but he's a lovely guy. But he helped you out in one spot where you were about to go and film at Larry Grew. And you could have been in some serious mess there, permanently serious mess from all accounts. Yeah. Um, yeah, so okay. perhaps just, just tell us a bit about that. Um, people should buy the book and find out. <laughs> okay, that's a but, good one. No, okay. No, no, I'm, no, I'll talk about it. It's just, it, I just find it a bit odd talking about myself this way, you know? It's like, I'm just a normal person, you know? I'm just Terry. I just do what I do. And yeah, but it's sometimes it's, it's, I mean, people it's like good for people to know. Like, oh. It's good for people to know a bit, a bit of the grit that you went through to achieve such great results. I mean, it's, okay. it's part well, of human life, really. 
it's going to sound daft, but I was watching Who Dares Wins or something like that, or Where Eagles Dares, actually, on the television whilst I was at home on a Sunday afternoon. And I felt this funny lump in the back of my shoulder around here. And I thought, there was that. And it was about the size of a pea. And that's all it was. But it just suddenly developed that afternoon. And, um, and it started to hurt. So my wife took me to A&E, the local hospital, and they said it was some kind of infected cyst or something. They gave me some penicillin. And I said, look, I'm off to the gangles for like, I'm going to be camping out like seven nights in a row. I might be dropping down to civilization. We're filming this gentleman for, a, you know, a long video I'm hoping to produce about the area. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. And um, it was actually when we, were, me and Chris were out attempting to film um, some scenes at the, the Boffy in the Larry group, uh, Corral Buddy. And um, we didn't get to the top of the Larry group because of this horrendous winter storm. And when we were heading back, we beat a retreat back, basically, and um, decided we are going to camp for the night in Rothy Mercus Forest. And I said, oh, do you know what? This bloody thing on my back is really killing me, Chris. And despite the cold, I said, can you have a look at it for me, pal? And I lifted me all my layers off, and his face, I'll never forget. And he said it was like this big and spitting blood and puff all over the back of my shoulder. And then, as he's saying that, I can see all this manky crust and everything on my base lay and I was like oh bugger that's not good and um, well we'll best go to the hospital tomorrow and then we went to the hospital in um, Aviemore and um, yeah it, it turned into something rather serious um, as it happened when they started doing the surgery on me and all the rest of it it was local at first they had to knock me out in the end because I was reacting badly to the anaesthetic um, the, uh, the surgeon said to me, you know, he, knew, he was aware and knew of Chris Towns and um, I tried to explain where we were going and he said, um, I'd never have made another night. I'd have died of blood poisoning and Chris would never have got a phone signal to try and help me or get a rescue out and all the rest of it. So I ended up being there for, I think it was at least a week, uh, not in the hospital. I, um, the lovely kind folk at a guest house I was staying in God bless them. They let me stay there for free just so I could go to the hospital yeah. every day because they wouldn't allow me to go anywhere else. And um, so all filming stopped and whatnot. So, yeah, it was a bit mad that. I've got a few more stories like that. but Yes. Yeah. Well, I was going to touch on them, but I'm not too sure now. <laughs> the things you've lived through, the things that this guy's gone through a lot of pain, you know, to bring you these films. This is what you've got to remember. So um, I forget most of it, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you buy the book, uh, it'll remind you. Uh, what else was I going to say? Uh, yeah. To be fair, <laughs> I, I read the book and I go, oh, yeah, bloody hell, I remember that now. You know, and I flick through the chapters and I, I don't remember that story and this, that, the other. So it brings it all flooding back. It yeah, frightens me Man in many respects, actually. <laughs> it's John Manning in that pub again. You, uh, yeah. you, you obviously returned, and I think you had another incident after you returned of something completely different, but also that was uh, threatening the actual production of the film. Um, but ultimately, you carried on to see the film through. But I noticed that you said you, at one stage you were carrying a 100-litre pack, carry, weighing something in the region of 70, 75 kilos. We're going to have a look at your equipment. I've got a, some pictures of your equipment list a bit later on for people that are interested. Um, but perhaps you can explain how a pack... Uh, weighs 75 kilos and then trudging through the snow and obviously what happened on one particular day. Well, I'm not too sure if it was Scorpel some, or was there another one. Well, yeah, sometimes oh, Mickledore, yeah. Yeah. Well, you want me to talk about where they fell off and died on the bloody snow drift there? Well, let's just start with what was in the rucksack and how it ends up being right, 75 okay. kilos and then, and then what it did well, to you when you're on top of the hill. Right, well, let me see. So, 100 litre rucksacks are very rare nowadays, unfortunately. So I only have a couple and the threads and that are going now. I've got duct tape on them and all sorts to keep them together. And the reason I've got a pack that large is because I have to accommodate all my video, video equipment, tripods, lenses, spare batteries, all the rest of it, plus my camping equipment, which I tend to gauge with what the prevailing weather will be so say it's the summer yeah i can get get some really nice super lightweight kit in there so it could be a tarp or a bivy or a you know a single hoop one-man tent type of thing 
But when it's winter, you know, you need something a bit stronger, particularly so if you're going to be out night after night in horrend possibly horrendous conditions. And then I have to think about my food. So I have to take the food with me as well. So that all adds to the weight. And the next thing you know, it's like 70 kilos plus, especially if it's winter because, you know, the down sleeping bag is bigger and heavier. There's down jackets, over trousers, all the rest of it, crampons, ice axe, walking poles even, you know, plus the filming kit and everything else. You know, it's it soon adds up. You just, you don't realise and you don't have a choice on it. There were times that I thought, well, I could go out for three or four nights and then drop down and collect more supplies and go out. But somewhere like the Scorfells film, for example, or even the Cairngorms, that really wasn't that choice to do that because I had to walk so far to get to places and follow my nose with the views I was after to the time of year and the prevailing weather. Um, but hey, you know, character building stuff at the end of the day and um, keeps you fit and at times you've know, got shoulders that make Arnold Schwarzenegger plush. Well, I, was, I thought you would do really. But I suppose the, the, the difficulty is from a filming point of view, there's, there's walking to get there wherever there may be, and as you say, walking between shots or whatever. But then um, once you're sort of setting your shot up, you're pretty well standing around, so you're not generating that heat. So I can understand why you're taking so much insulation to, to keep warm. And then, of course, you've got the practicalities of the of the batteries, which are notorious for going dead on you very quickly in the wrong weather. Yeah. Uh, then you've got yeah. to take into account, what, the demisting of the, the lenses, because you know what it's like when you go from warm to cold, cold to warm, your lens is missed up and you miss the shot because yeah. it's still full of water. Uh, it's uh, mm. you know it's, it's a lot, there's a lot there to think about rather than just taking the picture, you know. You're a smart guy, Bob. How come you know <laughs> this stuff? <laughs> I'm winding you up yeah. a bit. But no, it's true. A lot of people don't think about that, you know. I could acclimatise lenses for my cameras in the porch of my tent, for example. Say it's winter and I want to do some night time lapse. And so the camera's going to have to sit out there in the cold for a very, very long time. And depending on the humidity in the atmosphere frost dew could form on the lens so it ruins the shot because night time lapse takes hours because basically you're taking a picture of the night sky to see the stars and you, as a rule of thumb it needs to the picture needs to be taken for 20 seconds one picture is one frame of video and i film at 25 frames a second so i need 25 pictures for one second of the night sky as time lapse but i might need that time lapse shot for like 15 seconds of video and if you you know i'm not a mathematician but you start working it out and you, you're looking at three four hours there's the cold to deal with so what i ended up doing in the end to mitigate the risks of any shots being ruined as i take balls of elastic bands with me um i've got this i still got it around here somewhere i'm looking over that way uh, a wax hat from marks and spencers with fleece in like a deer stalker hat that my wife got me i'd stick that over the camera and underneath that with elastic bands i get you know those gel hand warmers and things like that that you get you use yeah. the elastic bands to keep them around the camera to keep the batteries warm the lens warm and hopefully there'd be a little bit of a breeze so no dew or frost would form on the front of the lens then that's it you're left to look and um well i can tell you from experience more often than not the shots fail but you do get those times where it's, you're lucky and, um, yeah, you bang, bang it, you know, bang it on the head with the shot. People might say, well, why don't you do it in the summer? Well, they tend to forget the further north you go in the UK, it, you know, especially in summer, it, there's no true dark skies. It's, you've got that glow, mm. the twilight glow on the horizon, especially in Scotland. Bloody hell, you know. It's almost like was... being in the Arctic Circle. You just don't get night time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What was your um, your wastage, your, your ratio to uh, to waste? So was it 10 to 1, 12 to 1, the amount of shots that you took and couldn't use or didn't use? Um, I've not really thought about it, to be honest. I just got on with it and dealt with it. I'd be, pardon my language, pissed off if a shot failed. Um, but you just, le you just learn from experience. So for me, particularly, it was always about you need that light breeze that keeps that humidity in the atmosphere going away from the lens and of course that depends where you're pointing the camera so if you're pointing it at the wind and if it's a bit humid even in winter 
it will all come onto the lens. So you need to look the other way, which isn't always ideal because you want it to have the shot there. You know, so you have to think outside the box a bit and adapt, work and move. So, you know, like a lot of the shots that I captured in general, ground level shots or whatever, um, in the daytime, through the seasons, you know, I probably got about 60% of what I hoped to capture on camera and the rest of it was just pure luck. Pure luck being the right place, the right time. And that was all because, you know, I'd be camped there on the fell and just pure luck suddenly, bloody hell, there's an inversion. And that's it, out with the cameras. Do, so, you, um, yeah. do, you, do you ever find that, um, just as pure as a camping question, really, I mean, I know what it's like. I'm not as disciplined as you, obviously, but I'm, I'm, you know, you're snuggled up in your tent <laughs> and uh, you're snuggled up in your tent and you've got your bag and you're nice and toasty having been out for a wet few hours. And you think, you look, you look at your watch or you look at the weather forecast, you think, oh, I better get out again and press the button or whatever it may be. Do you ever sort of like, oh, I don't really want to go? Yeah, most times, to be honest, because... Yeah. I'm enjoying the moment. I'm enjoying the comfort. I'm enjoying the ambience. I'm enjoying the atmosphere. I'm enjoying the scenery. And then I think, oh, bloody, I'll have to get my bloody camera out now. And mm. the thing with filming, or not so much with taking photos, because bang, 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 you've got the photo done. With filming, you've got to think about so much with the sound, because you can't, as I like to say, cheat what you're filming, which is why I take quite, quite pride in my photography, because... What you see in the pictures is what I actually filmed and vice versa. I like to get with, with video, you've got to get it right in camera. So, you know, it's not like I have access to a Hollywood studio and I can bloody green screen everything and CGI and all that. I'm capturing the real deal. These are moments mm. people can see with their own eyes on a given day, a given time and a given season, given weather. And that to me is where I get so excited of those special moments. That I capture so yeah I'll be filming and then I, I get detached from the atmosphere of it all because I'm concentrating so much on the bloody tech of it all which is why I kind of prefer photography because you just go bang bang done but with the filming you know, do I need a pan shot yeah I need a pan shot do I need to pan up and down I don't know but I'll do it anyway because you just never know when it comes to the edit what shot do you need and um, that that's the frustrating bit and then yeah then I get in my tent the moment's all gone, and I think, oh, I can switch off now, have a cup of tea, have a beer, and get food on the go on the stove. And then I think, hmm, I wanted to enjoy that, but I couldn't because I was filming. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, from it. I get it from it, of course. Yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of people uh, end up with that. You know, it's, it's a joy to go and see these things and record it, but sometimes you actually miss the moment because you spend too much time focusing. But let's move forward mm. a bit now. Um, the, obviously, the film came to an end and you launched it. And uh, I, I, I'm guessing up to that point, only a handful of people. I mean, you had a local support, obviously, but it was a local social group or a local network that were behind you and a couple of sponsors and, a, and the people that helped you out. And then all of a sudden it went. When did, you, when did the first film get on the BBC? How did it get on the BBC? And, and then what happened after it was shown? Um... Well, I obviously finished Scorfield Pike um, and I arranged to have its premiere at the Reggae Centre near Penrith where they got this larger than IMAX screen and I just left them to it. I supplied the files and says, yeah, charge this on the tickets or whatever and I'll be there because they wanted me there for an intro and outro and um, never thought anything more about it until a few days before I had to come to Cumbria because I wasn't living in Cumbria at the time. And then I found out, well, I turned up and I said, bloody hell, there's some crowds here. What's going on? They're all here for your film, Terry. And I was like, bugger off, really? I nearly swore then, they'll watch my language. And I was like, bullshit, bull, you know, bull poo. And they're like, no, seriously. And I got so nervous because like 300 people there and I end up bloody necking about 10 pints and having about four whiskeys and a couple of glasses of champagne. Really nervous about it. And... Um, and a vivid memory for me as a turning point really was the end of the film. I was out the back in a dark corridor because I knew I had to go on at the end of the credits and all that kind of thing. And I knew the film back of me hand because I've been working on it in the edit for like three months and so on. 
So I knew the soundtrack and all the sounds and everything. But it was just hearing people laugh or gasp. And I thought, what are they laughing and gasping about? Or, you know, I was getting a bit paranoid. <laughs> and then when the credits rolled, it was just silence. And I went, ah, oh, shit. They ate it. They bored out their brains. They hate it. I don't want to go out on stage now. And then I'll never forget the moment I went out through the door and onto the stage. And yeah, it, it will, it will crazy. Something that will live me, live with me for the rest of my life. And um, I'm not making a joke. I was mobbed like the bloody Beatles afterwards. And I was just stunned for about a week going, crikey, they love it. And then it was about three months later, I started getting all these bloody with our number calls on my phone and I was actually out filming another DVD, not for TV or anything like that, just a walking program. And just being naturally cynical, I thought bloody with our number, you know, I bet it's a spam call or something. So I never answered it. And eventually after three, nearly three months, I answered it. And it turned out the bloody BBC, they got wind of the film and they said, we'd like to have a specific version, a bespoke version of skillful pipe for them to go on the television. And um, I couldn't believe it. And then I was a bit annoyed that I had to cut this two hour film down to an hour. And it got to the point where I was like, I don't care anymore. I've had enough of it. No one's going to watch it. It's shit. And because, um, for example, the TV version has got bugger all winter in it. And there's loads of winter in the Skillful Spike film. But the t BBC version has, doesn't really have a lot of the wintry scenes that I captured and really, you know, Busted my proverbial over to get these shots. And, um, well, what do I know? <laughs> it became a bloody smash hit. And, and then again, as others told me, like Eric Robson and others who were aware of what was going on, it changed my life overnight. And um, so in a roundabout way, I was coerced into doing Blaine Kaffer after that sooner rather than later because <laughs> I was bloody knackered after Scorpful Pike. <laughs> Well, I gather you're, uh, at the at the premiere, uh, you had a seal of approval from Josh Naylor, which I thought was hilarious. Josh Naylor, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, obviously that, one of the characters that, in the film. Yeah, he is. Well, he's a legend, isn't he, of Cumbria? You Absolutely. Know, a, you know, yeah. Probably one of the greatest athletes we should have had in the Olympics, but never had. You know, and he's just a farmer from bloody West Cumbria in Wasdale, and you know, he's such a nice guy. I've got a lot of time for Josh and get on very well with him. And um, I must admit, that's been a bit tough, not having to go around and catch up with him and over the last years or so with mm. lockdown. But um, I kind of forgot of sorts at the time at the end that he was in the audience. I mean, I knew he was there because I invited him to it and everything else. I thought, you know, you want to see this film, mm. you're in it, blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was actually an audience member when I was doing this question and answer session. And they said, what does Josh Naylor think of it? And I went, well, as it happens, he's in the audience tonight. And I've spotted him in the crowd. And I'll never forget, because I'm, I'm mimic, you know, mimicking here, holding the mic. And I suddenly felt like a little boy, you know, looking up to him. <laughs> All right, Josh, um, what did you think of it, mate? And I just pointed the mic his way and he said, I like, it was fucking brilliant. And then the whole audience erupted in laughter and applause. And I'll be honest, it, it gave me chills and I was like, good. The legend thinks I did all right. And he yeah, did say some good. other words, you know, he's saying about the shots are captured. He only seen when he's been shepherded and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, that was, that was a special moment for me. Yeah. Might not be to well, others, but it, it was, was for me. Yeah, no, it's, it's, that's the genuine sort of, uh, adorational feedback you want, isn't it? I, I mean, obviously he's an incredible runner and I gather, uh, David, um, David Thompson, is it? Um, David Powell Thompson. Yeah. Powell Thompson. That's right. Um, you, you, strug you struggled to uh, keep up with a pair of them when they were running up and down the hills for some such shots. Well, all sorts. Yeah. They're like bloody polecats, the pair of them. They really are. I often say I think it's the fresh, clean fell area in Cumbria that, you know, energises them and keeps them as fit and as young as they are physically when they're out and about on the fells. But, um, yeah, David's a, a top, top bloke, and um, I owe a lot to David as well. You know, we've become best of mates over the years, and um, I'm very thankful for him. I remember the first time I um, saw him, at least, in person, was walking into the Strands Inn and Brewery in Nether Wasdale, which happens to be one of his locals. And 
I frequent there a lot now. And because um, I was seeking somewhere that had decent beer and a Sunday dinner because my wife had joined me for a weekend when I was doing the Scorefells film. And I went, bloody hell, it's him. He was in Wainwright Walks with Julia Bradbury, this legend taking her along sharp edge and this, that, the other. And, um, yeah, we ended up getting to know each other and became good friends since. And he's featuring a lot of my work and be it scenes in the Life of Matting films, but, you know, walking programs that I do with him. We just we just connect, you know, we're, we're good friends. That's good, that's good. And also, I mean, the, the, the fame and fortune, well, I hope the fortune anyway, but certainly the fame that <laughs> followed, I, I guess you were getting all sorts of text messages from people like Richard Hammond, uh, asking you about wild camping spots oh, and that sort of stuff. Right. Yeah, well, hopefully he doesn't watch this. But, <laughs> yeah, there are, well, there are messages, and, you know, I'm quite prolific on the social media, sharing pictures of where I've been for the day and all that kind of thing. They're not necessarily good pictures, you know what I mean? I'm just showing that I'm out and about them, where I'm exploring. And obviously at times, but like, say, recently with the Helvellyn film, I'm, I'm showing scenes of what I'm capturing, so I'm out at dawn or on a wild camp and all the rest of it. Because, you know, I always want to inspire people to get outside, you know, and explore places that they wouldn't necessarily go and explore because the a lot of people that visit places like the Lake District, Peak District, or wherever, you know, they go to the usual spots. I want to encourage, we've got open access land for crying out loud. Go and explore, seek new viewpoints, find your own peace and solitude. And all the rest of that, that you know, all it entails. And, um, and there was a couple of camps I was on round just for fun and leisure around Worcester. And I kept getting some private messages, as one example, from a Richard. And there were lovely messages, paying me lots of compliments with my work and all the rest of it. And there was this particular camp I was on. And there was this lovely, gorgeous light as the sun was setting out over the Irish Sea and all the rest of it. And my phone was pinging, and I was like, look, bugger off. Whoever you are, I don't want to reply. I'm, I want to enjoy the moment. And it, I don't know, it was like two weeks later, I thought, who's this Richard guy? And I checked out their profile and realised it's bloody Richard Hammond off Top Gear and stuff. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. And I felt like a right knob, being a bit rude, thinking. But then at the end, same time, I'm right, because I was enjoying the moment. I don't want to be bloody pinged on my phone and stuff. I wanted to enjoy the sunset. And, you know, and there's lots of stories like that that my family take the mick out of me for, admittedly. But um, I just, I, th I find it extremely flattering that they like my work and what I do. And, you know, I'm just a modest guy. You know, if they like what I do or anyone else watching now, they like what I do, great. You know, if they think it's crap, fair enough. You know, all these things are subjective, but it, it is funny sometimes when I get these messages and I go, well, whatever, and I find out, like, oh, crikey, it's that person. But at the end of the day, you shouldn't treat them any differently. We're all flesh and blood. Oh, yeah. We're all just yeah, absolutely. human beings. So it doesn't matter you're famous or not, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just uh, interesting the uh, the way it unfolded. Um, so what I was going to come on to now was, obviously, that then led you into Blend Catherine. I think you had a bit of a break um, before you started that one. Is there anything, I mean, the... the the outcome from from um, the first film, did it change mm. your formula or how you approach the second film? Obviously, you took some of the uh, took the money and reinvested it in some new gear and um, etc., which we'll look at as I say in a while. Um, and that moved forward. Did you approach it in a different way? Was there anything about it, the sort of formula that you were using? Did it sort of change in any way? Yeah, I kind of structured it properly. The score for Pike, I made it up as I went along. Um, I had a very clear idea how I wanted it to start, as in like the opening 10, 15 minutes, a middle and an ending and the rest, because it's a documentary after all, and I'm at the mercy of the weather, the terrain, the time, and people's diaries, the people that I'd like to film and include on camera. So with Ben Cathra, it was different in that I structured it more clearly to help me in my mind's eye because I did do Blaine Catherine just under 14 months in the end. And also there was the technical side of things because I was using a, a bloody crap camera on Skillful Pike. So or any money I made of Skillful Pike, I invested in Blaine Caffrey, despite seeking money with sponsors and crowdfunding because I was keen to make it 
better than the first one, but different. Um, technically, as, as well as all the rest of it, you know, in terms of film grammar or people that appear on camera and all, and all that. And also, there were ideas I had for Skillful Pike um, that I never had the time, the equipment, the money to do, so be it the aerial shots, or for me personally, it was a song. I always wanted this bespoke song about Skillful Pike. So, uh, Freddie, I'm a composer um, who worked with me on Skillful Pike, and, and the rest of them, um, you know, he came up with the idea of this motif, as he does, but this could be a song. So then I sought out local groups and singers and all that kind of thing, and then decide on Sing Out, a local folk singing group that go outside and sing, you know, traditional Cumbrian songs as well as unique ones, original ones. And, um, and I approached them, I said, look, do you reckon you could come up with lyrics for this motif? that the composers come up with, because I'd like that as a song in the film. That's something that resonates with the area and promotes the heritage and culture and history of the area. So, and yeah, so little things like that, really. And um, and also things like with Stuart McCauley and Ed Byrne and David Powell Thompson and Sharp Edge. It was my way of experimenting. Where can I go mm. when I do a trilogy? Because there always was going to be a trilogy. Um, and I thought, well, people take to that, whether they like that. And so I had to think about how am I filming that? And for me, with Sharp Edge, with them at least, um, I wanted it to be quite uh, visceral. You know, feel, we feel like when we're watching it, we're there with them. Mm. And it's all one take stuff. It's all their natural voice. Nothing scripted, bar things like I go, David, can you say something about Matt in Rescue? Stuart, can you say something about this point where Wainwright references where you might have to sit on your bum because you're that frightened and so on and so forth. The rest of it is them, you know, and that's how I work and it works. You know, it's one of my favourite scenes in the, the documentary. And so it from is, yeah. from that, you know, I, I drew strength and confidence and thankfully, um, Ben Caffer did all right as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And did, um, did the... BBC say we'll take whatever comes next uh, regarding Blen 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 Cathra. Blen Cathra. or it, did you did you have to make it first and of. then they said we'll take it? Well, I'm independent. I'm freelance, so they they acquire the product from me, and um, right. obviously Skillful Pike had done very very well. Um, well, for them, I didn't really see a lot of money out of it in that respect compared to what they bloody make or what they pay for programs. No disrespect to BBC or ITV or production companies that do all that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I'm just, it was, it's a passion project. It's a love letter to the fellows, as I always say. This is something I've always had in my mind. I don't want to get distracted with anything else, you know. Terry will offer you this, come and do that. I'm not interested. I want to do this about Lakeland, and this is the project I'm working on. Um, so now I, they, they were mindful, of course, because of viewing figures and things, and um, cause that's what they're about, isn't it, TV? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, they wanted it. They had to pay me a bit more for it than the first one, because I said, you took the mick out of me from the last one, and I'd like a bit more money now. And so I had to haggle on that, and then they agreed. And then, thankfully, Ben Caffrey was a hit for them as well. No, so that, that added something to my, I don't know, my CV, if you like, or yeah, credibility yeah, yeah. with... Yeah, excellent, excellent. Okay, folks, well, I'd just like to remind you that uh, you're welcome to drop some comments in the chat. We're struggling to get the comments up on the screen uh, this uh, show for some reason, technical issues, but I can read the comments out. So if you have a question particularly that we're going to put to Terry at the Q&A uh, section at the end, then just start it with a capital Q so we can um, add it to our list and I'll read those off the screen when the time comes. Um, so that was a, that was a hit. And what did, was it, uh, didn't you have, ah, uh, yes, yes, you had this um, unfortunate, you had a break, and unfortunately that led to a cycling accident, which and sort of put back your, your plans for starting the next film in Hell Valley. Yes, that's true. But I thought you might show some clips from the work so I can pop off for a pee or something like that, Bob. But can we come to that in a bit? But yeah, with regards to this cycling accident, um, 
Yeah, I wanted a break after Blaine Caffer because I, I, I'm not daft, you know. I'm well aware of the public perception of me and my work. Um, the people that I loved the first two, which I'm always, always be thankful for. And I feel very, very fortunate that they, they think that way and feel that way. Um, some of it's really quite touching, you know, um, emails I've had from people that are sadly not with us now because they had terminal cancer and funerals and all that kind of thing is stuff I don't really talk about publicly normally, but I'll mention that now because I get, I get lots of that and I, I find it, well, it, it, it can cut me up a bit because I'm a human being just like the rest of us. So it's touching. Um, so that in mind and the success of the other two, I thought I really want to take my time now on Helvellyn. I want to, I don't want this to be a Return of the Jedi or Godfather Part 3. You know, I really wanted it to be the best of the first two and something more so the three of them are individual films, but you can watch them as a complete trilogy. But this would be the most spectacular one yet. So it was bubbling away. And then um, at this point, I've been fortunate enough to achieve a lifelong dream. Me and my wife had moved up to Cumbria, so we live in the Eden Valley now. And, um, and I absolutely bloody love it. And, um, yeah, I was out cycling one day and cut long story short. Um, I was a naughty boy, I didn't have me cycling helmet on because I thought, well, I'm just only popping down the bloody road for three miles um, on a normal bike after that because I've got an electric mountain bike now, which are bloody brilliant. Um, yeah, and there's just some fog in a valley and I went down at a certain speed and I knew the road, I knew there was some hairpin bends and stuff, hit the brakes. And it was a bit of twilight, you know, it was twilight, it wasn't dark. And next thing I know, I was flying off the bike at 20 odd miles an hour and hit head first into a stone wall. And well, I don't really remember much about that period. That's where you have to, I don't know, read what John Manning wrote about me in the book from talking to me and stuff. And, or even if you could talk to my wife, but um, cause that's where a lot of the info comes from. I was proper buggered up big time for months. And um, it was in that recovery period that I went, do you know what? You only live once, don't you? Part of my language, fuck it. I'm doing El Valen now. Even though I'm not fully recovered, I'm doing it now. I ain't got the money for it yet. I'll worry about that later. I'm going for it. And I decided this is going to take a long time now. I'm going to spend at least two years on this. So I want two of each season. I'm doing three fingers there. The reason that is a bloody Freudian slip because it ended up being three bloody years doing the documentary. But two of each season so I accommodate all the landscape shops I want to get all the weather phenomena the people because obviously people have their own lives there's diaries and everything else to work with as well as the weather blah 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 and I also for once proper structured it every damn scene what I wanted why and where to make people interested in history what that links to to geology, to something funny, to something heartwarming, to something exciting and dramatic. I planned it to the detail. Didn't get all I wanted in the end, but um, do you know what? It's the first film I've done ever. <laughs> well, in less than 10 years, I think. <clears throat> I pretty much nailed that, you know? I almost got everything I wanted. It bugged me a bit on stuff I didn't get. Um, and those who know me will know what that is, including scenes that I've ended up deleting that they, you know, they feature in. But um, almost got it. And then Freddie as well with the score, absolutely fantastic. He um, knocked it out of the park. Well, we'll we'll come on to Freddie in uh, a little clip of, of him shortly. But I shall take your hint that you you need a um, a comfort break, as they call. So I'm going to run uh, run your uh, trilogy promotional section so you've got two minutes and 90 seconds to 90 seconds two minutes, 20 seconds of things to have it to have a pee so i'll Bloody leave you hell. to it all right um. <laughs> Such 
Chiseled out to blow the pot A monument of timeless time and spirit Like an eagle's song glide When mountains meet the sky This is a place for the senses, memory and hope, light and shade. This is a place of land and lives interwoven. Certainly when you uh, see all the, the scenes together, um, they look fantastic. And, and as you explained earlier on, the amount of time some of those time lapses take uh, are very, uh, very... Uh, uh, it's worth considering when people just look at something and say, oh yeah, it was a very, very pretty shot of the clouds moving, but actual fact that's probably a good few hours work. Um, what uh, I was going to come on to was uh, sort of looking at some of the... Um, products now that have uh, have come out of it. Obviously, you've got your the book that we're referring to that you've um, uh, that uh, that you've produced, or John Manning's written uh, autobiography for you. Um, the um, there's a whole range of things. There's obviously calendars, pictures with your photography, um, a sort of a little micro I've business going on. I've gone all commercial now. Bob. You I've have, yeah. I've got to make money, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, they've got your own beer as well, which I think is is probably your finest yeah. achievement. Uh, yeah, man with that. <laughs> and then, uh, and then of course, there's the uh, the situation where you're where are we um, uh, mixing with the the different lovers of the of the outdoors world or different lovers of the social world? Where are we? Uh, wrong button. Uh, and uh, doing various talks and various presentations. So the demand on your time must be it must be quite high, really. Um, and I understand now. Obviously, I saw that one of the sponsors of the the Hell Valley was the University of Cumbria. They themselves were sponsors, but you've ended up uh, working for them. Yeah, yeah. What well, that's a, a well, one of the proudest moments of my life. To be fair, um, I had a meeting with the university. I thought it was just an update about where I was going with the film, because at that point um, I had been working with um, Paul Bacon and Nathan Buckley, a couple of students from the university film students. I took them under my wing for, oh, crikey, just over over a year anyway, out of the three years of the Hell Valley film. And because I, I kind of grudgingly agreed that I'll take on some young apprentices, if you like. I wasn't sure they'd be up to the task, but they were, and they absolutely bloody blossomed. I'm so tremendously proud of them because they both got first in their degrees at university, and they're doing well now with 
work with prints and all sorts of stuff but um yeah so i thought the meeting was about that you know as an update but actually for me i was like i need a bit more money you know i've got a few months to go and i'm not sure i've got enough money and i don't know if the uni can help me and um it was dr lois mansfield who was there in the room before the vc turned up and i mentioned it to her and all she did was laugh at me and i thought what are you laughing at i'm dead serious i, I need a bit more money for this i don't want to go capping and to bloody crowdfunding and everything else you know i'm almost spent and and of course by that point people really don't have a clue of what i've been filming and how it was all coming together so all i could show them was like little clips of such short scenes or photos they look trust me it's all coming falling into place now it's going to be great and then um yeah the vc judy menel threw a right curveball at me um wanted me to be professor of practice for the university and um i was stunned and dr lois said to me afterwards first time she's ever seen me lost for words and i'm silent so on that note i'll stay silent now <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a major achievement from starting ten years ago doing a doing a blog for out of passion, isn't it? It's fantastic. So congratulations. That really is a is a wonderful um, wonderful success. Do excuse my wife blowing her nose in the background if you can hear it. Or love. That's the hay Terrible. fever, isn't it? It's the hay fever. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I certainly hope it's not COVID. Otherwise, it's coming this way. But anyway, uh, yes. Yeah, so, all love. Anyway, uh, let's. Uh, I think we touched on a lot of things, really. If people want to ask any questions, do start your message on uh, YouTube or Facebook with a capital Q, so I can uh, bring them in or, or read them out. Um, I just want to touch on gear, really, a bit of a gear story for for, for people that are interested in in that type of thing. Um, obviously, your gear. Uh, changed over over time and I think people might be surprised to see how um, well as you described earlier on how it added up to 75k but also when they take into consideration the actual details so um, if we look at that at, uh, in uh, in more detail where are we uh, there we go so on Scorefell you started off I mean even though that appears to be a small amount of equipment the associated bags and um, batteries and yeah. cables and I mean the one thing I didn't put on here actually and the one thing I didn't see in the in your uh, list was the uh, the tripod of course and the sliders and that sort of things which are yeah. not not yeah. small items no and they're bloody heavy and all and yeah. they're, they're a pain in the arse to carry on trains and stuff like that so yeah I'd have to work out ways with um, strapping them to my pack and all the rest of it because you just never knew whether you need that equipment at some point out on the shoots so he just took it anyway you know and um yeah it's a good little still uh display you got there you know bob because that that pretty much is the kit there's yeah. a couple of other things that are missing like but yeah but yeah just that itself i mean that camera that video camera is not particularly great but that's all i could afford at the time and i thought well it's kind of professional isn't it you know and it's something i try and instill in the students now that i work with at the university of cumbria is it's not about the tools it's about the craft you know it's about the story what are you trying to convey you know to around in a roundabout way you could do it on your bloody phone now if you wanted to if the sound quality is good and everything else but we we all know that's not going to be good enough quality but it's ultimately it's the stories the people the connection how you draw people in so I like looking at stills like this because it reminds me of where it all started and then where it bloody evolved to all the other equipment mm. that you're showing now on this other still. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's certainly starting to add up now, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. looking at you've got uh, what four items there: five, six, seven, eight, eight, nine items that all need batteries. So, mm. how many how many spares of the batteries did you take? Uh, more than enough because you just never knew you never knew because of the temperature the weather or how long i'd be out and about or the next time i'd be able to recharge batteries and all the rest of it um so always more than enough or as somebody i became friends with at the time um, at the bbc locally at least cameraman said to me give yourself enough rope to hang yourself with terry and that's always stuck in my head and that applies to filming but also the equipment and batteries and everything else because you just never know 
if you're going to miss those moments because you ain't got the power or you haven't filmed them and all that kind of thing. So looking at this equipment now, were you using the Canons for still pictures and the Sonys for video? Or, yeah. Or yeah. how are you using it? Is that right? Yeah. Can't quite see at my end. Is this for the Helvellyan film you're looking at? This is there? the Blend Cathro, this is. Yeah, well, uh, that's the Helvellyan. Oh, but it's pretty much. <laughs> okay, it's a bit more. Um, yeah, so there's a camera there on the top left. Um, that's a Sony camera. That's my run and gun camera, as I call it. So that's the one where I can leave a lot of things in auto. But I still got manual control of because it's something I've got to be quick and shooting with and I'm mimicking it. So it's usually people. So it could be something like the striding edge scene in the Hell Valley film where Stuart McConey and David Howard Thompson are tackling striding edge. So that's my run and gun. You're running and gunning for shots and you've got to make sure it's right. So you've still got to watch it, got to control it, and the sound's really good and it's broadcast quality video as well, which is handy. And it's actually really rather small camera. I've I think I've got it here, mate. I got them out ready when you asked me the other day. So here you go. Without the battery. So it looks it looks like a small camcorder. But that's mm. as small and light as a you know professional broadcast quality camera will get nowadays of sorts. Technology is always changing. Oh, actually I'm missing the lens hood there, but there you go. Um even little things actually about saying that is the fluff on the mic you know i take that off carefully don't bloody wreck it so there's the mic hold it up against me white background so you can see it and that's the fluff these things are bloody cheap but they help cut out the wind you get them you know standard ones all right but if it's a windy windy day out on the fells they're not very good at all so you need something better to mitigate wind interference because you just won't bloody hear people um yeah, yeah. and then the, yeah, the middle one on the top is a sony a7s the original model the mark one um that's what i call my uh felscapes camera so i would use that for just purely filming the felscape so from out on a wild camp i wouldn't have to take the other one but i take that one but i also take the canon camera or cameras because i've used them for stills but also for time lapse and then, of course, I need all the lenses for them and in the batteries. Um, the drone stuff, well, I work with Tom Jacobs of um, Orbital Filming for drone shots. Occasionally, I take, take a drone out. Um, I didn't want to because it was just more bloody bulk and whatnot in my pack and more batteries to carry and all the rest of it. Um, the slider, I didn't take out so much on the Hell Valley film, on the fells at least. I would use that for the valley based shots the microphones and stuff they're they're a given they're a given because you, you it's something as i often say to the students now you know they, they all get excited they want to run out and film and i go yeah but you know actually arguably the most important thing is the sound because you could film the most fantastic visual visuals of whatever you're doing but if the sound is crap people tune out if the sound is good and you film something crap or poorly with a crap camera or even on your phone people will watch it um, yeah, the sound is really really important as it is for us tonight doing the stream did you um the two pocket uh, mp3 recorders you got there two zooms is that mm. how with the with the tie clip mic is that how you mic'd up yeah. the guys going across the edge or yeah. did you, you, you yeah. didn't use radio mics then no, I, I can't afford radio mics and well i might be able to now a little bit but i don't want to Right. And they've they've you know they've done me all right. So yeah, yeah. I uh, white tie clip mics them. So for those that are watching and don't really get it, that little recorder thing will sit in their pocket, but there'll be a microphone on it, like I'm holding here, clipped to my shirt, and it record. It's a nice sound hearing the person's voice when they're far away and so on and so yeah. forth, yeah. or even close up for interviews and all the rest of it. The problem I got then is I've got to sync that sound. <laughs> as I'm filming it to what I'm recording with the mics on my camera. It's laborious at times, especially if they're really far away or it's quite windy, but you know, patience is a virtue. You could yeah, get yeah, wireless yeah. ones, so it all goes straight in my camera and I'd have to worry about it, but 
Yeah, I'm a I'm a bit yeah, of a York battery. So I don't want to spend the money and batteries and more kit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I think uh, people, uh, if you've got any questions, do uh, do type them into the uh, into the chat there and uh, into YouTube and Facebook. Um, we'll be taking those shortly. What I thought I'd do now is uh, we'll just have a look at uh, the video clip with with Graham Darby, uh, who is your opera singer. And how Freddie put it together. It's only a short clip, and then we'll uh, we'll come on to talking a bit about Freddie as well, because his his contribution to the films have really been quite something, haven't they? Mm, mm, absolutely. Here we go. Then. What I genuinely hope is that this is not a one-off; that it's the start of something more. That's what I genuinely hope. Well, you say that. I've been telling one. This is the last one, and I'll be buggered if I'm doing out like this again <laughs> on my own. But we'll see. We'll see. We'll, you know? see. we'll see what happens. Yeah. I'll, um, I might change my mind in a few months and that sort of itch you might, starts coming well, back. Well, you might miss that buzz, you see. You might yeah, miss that I know. buzz. I, I kind of already am already, to be honest, and it's only been like three bloody months. Yeah, no, um, I and you know. I tell my wife that. No, don't. And your hair was black when I saw you the last <laughs> time in all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I have a joke about that, but I better not say it in case she's watching. So <laughs> this is from working with you and Freddie for the last few months. <laughs> distant glow it is your calling before the shore it stands alone there observing life tall as his shadow warm as his light the mountain sings his voice so um that's uh, obviously Graham, and the contribution Freddie made to to the whole series is obviously quite impressive. How did you start the relationship with Freddie? Was it just pure coincidence you met him? Because obviously he's based in Israel, and I know you haven't been out there for a holiday recently. So how did uh, how did that work? Now, we say obviously, but to people that might be watching, well, bloody now will they? But uh, yeah, um, it was when I was seeking music for the Schofields film, and. Um, well, I did have a budget for a composer or anything like that. And um, so I realized I had to go down the stock music route. And for those that are watching, they may not be aware that you can get websites and TV, film, all sorts. You know, they can go to these sites and you purchase a license for like two, three minutes of music, not really much longer. And you have to pay a bloody whack for it. And so therefore the soundtracks of some programs are just literally focused on stock music. There's no real proper soundtrack for it. And that's what I wanted with Life of a Mountain. And it was whilst browsing some of these sites, I came across a, a certain track that Freddie had composed on one of these stock sites. And I thought, that's absolutely brilliant. And straight away, I thought, that's the composer I want. I want him to do Skillful Pike. So I did a bit of Googling, got his contact details, got in touch with him, and then, um, yeah. We became friends. He said, yeah, I'd love to do Skillful Pike. And and the really, really pleasing thing for me is that where Skillful Pike was a game changer, a life changer for me, it was for Freddie too. You know, bloody hell, he's been off to L.A. and stuff in Hollywood and doing what he's doing now with the scoring of music. And I'm still <laughs> extremely fortunate. He wants to work with me still now, and I'm just little old Terry and bloody Cumbria doing what I'm doing with a few cheap cameras out on the fells. And so, yeah, very, very fortunate. And oh, he's a, he's a God given talent. He really is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just thought I'd, uh, I'd play that clip that you, you sent me uh, where he is talking a bit about the film and people get an idea of, <laughs> of uh, some of the work that he put into it. It was very tough 
and I liked it every second because every second I watch it, every time it was for me, I felt like uh, felt chills every time I watched it. I have to say the uh, no, that one. Sorry, I have to say the uh, the shot there of going down the slope uh, with, with the music uh, just is absolutely magnificent. Was that using the DJI drone you've got there, or was that one of the drone companies? No, supplying? no, no, bloody hell, no! It was all new tech. It was um, born out of I think you might have some stills, uh, a gentleman with his goggles on, an aerial sticking oh, yeah, out, yeah. And, and what it was, I put put word out with friends and a friend of mine, Adam, a good friend of mine is in the paragliding scene in the closing scenes of the film, as well as the poem bit of the full film. <laughs> Unfortunately, not the uh, BBC version. He says, you know, I know this, I know this guy out in the Northeast and you know, he's a bloody good FPV drone pilot. And this is kind of new tech now. It's going to, I think it become more mainstream soon. And I said, you know what, I've always had this idea of the flight of the raven going around Elvelin in winter, down the gullies and everything else. And it was an idea I had germinating in a way, and I didn't know how to do it because I wanted it to be at the, the end of Helvelin film, my version of the Helvelin film, not the BBC version, as to end it on a spectacular high, like a roller coaster, because prior to that we got the RAF and stuff. And people have seen that in the BBC version. But if the BBC version ending is completely different to my ending. So it's all about building the momentum, the emotional power, and then this excitement and drama. And, um, yeah, we spent two, three days doing these shots. The weather wasn't, wasn't conducive for it at times, I have to admit. So it was a bit frustrating. So I didn't get as many shots um, with Seb the pilot as I wanted because um, we you know, he'd, he'd got his bespoke drone, FPV drone, or I should say first-person drone, first-person point-of-view drone, hence he's got goggles on. So me and others have to be around with binoculars watching the bloody thing as it's flying around for safety reasons. I got all the permissions with the John Muir Trust and everything to do this kind of thing around there. But we always did it when there would be no bugger around, basically. So it'd be like dawn, dusk, or days like you're seeing now in the stills where... You know, it's quite wintry, but it was a weekday. So we wouldn't we wouldn't intrude on anybody that are out on the fells because, to be honest, I hate bloody drones because I find them noisy and annoying. And I wish people wouldn't buzz them about when people are out and about on the fells in, in numbers, you know. Show a bit of respect. People are there for a bit of peace and quiet. So that's why we I always do, and people like Seb, do this stuff when people are not around. The unsociable hours, if you like. But then it's those unsociable hours where you get the nice dramatic light and shot. So, um, yeah, it was incredible stuff. Um, it was tricky. No accidents happened, thankfully. And um, then it was a matter of, okay, I've got this now. I know where it wants to sit in the film. Now it's about the music. And that's where Freddie just absolutely knocked it out of the park. If you watch in context of the film, as opposed to in isolation, viewers will appreciate how it really adds to the emotional moment of the film as we build up to the finale. If you watch it in isolation, you might go, oh, it's a bit overly dramatic, isn't it, with this music and a few shots like that. But no, trust me, if you watch the full version and that ending, and I think we're coming to that in a bit, aren't we, Bob? <laughs> what a nice lead-in you've just done there. Good man, good man. So this is a this is a treat for people now that only seen the uh, the BBC version. I'm going to show you the editor's cut, uh, which is the bit that was chopped off the end that uh, that Terry's most upset about, which is understandable. So get your your questions in and comments, and we'll do a few of those, and then we'll wrap the show up after this. But enjoy a few min minutes of this. We're in 
A very fortunate position of being able to walk up a mountain and not have to walk down, thanks to the beauty of these paragliders. It's the simplest form of flight, really. Man's oldest dream. So for me personally, this is now nearly 30 years to the day when I first flew off this mountain, when I was 19 years old and I first learned to fly. I'm now taught this sport for the last 30 years. Many people are always saying, you must be nuts, chucking yourself off here. It's a very safe sport to do. The knowledge is in being smart about the weather, understanding the weather. And here we are now, about to jump off over this beautiful Helvellyn Vista to harness the power of the elements and to carry us down into the valley and up to land right next to the pub if all goes well. These fells are so special, they simply take your breath away and they give unconditionally to us all. This is a working landscape full of traditions and old ways and if we don't keep them we lose everything that Lakeland is, a place where we work with nature and not against her. This is a place of land and lives interwoven. Its future is quite simply in our hands. distant glow, a timeless flow of secret whispers and evermore, a sight to breathe if you believe, through all his wonders there's time to live, an open meadow, a distant glow, it is your calling before the shore. It stands alone there, observing life, tall as his shadow, warm as his light. The mountain sings, his voice is bright, a perfect sunrise to end the night, a perfect day to find our way towards the mountain where I shall stay. The top is nearly beyond this stone I'll soon be standing, yet not alone I'll stand with him now We'll watch the sky, we'll watch the birds 
birds as they fly by back yes excellent well and i finally got the uh, the social media working as well so that's really good so we'll bring some of the social comments in uh let us uh, do that right now uh right we've had from charles chris b uh he has uh, said he's watching from just outside uh, edinburgh and uh, that he's a good friend of terrors which is uh, good to Good to see. Uh, Charles uh, what, asked the question, which I think you answered right at the very beginning, about uh, the sponsorship, whether you're, a, because you're an unknown quantity, whether you um, contacted Rab or they contacted you. But I think you had a relationship with them before you actually started the, um, the film. That, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I was doing gear testing and stuff like that and um, reviewing their kit in an independent way on um, social media, which they liked, um, you know, because I'd give them feedback saying that doesn't work or I think that bit of kit's great and so on and so forth. And, um, yeah, um, so I pointed it to them because I had a good relationship with them and I knew they invested in independent outdoors films and stuff. And it was it was just the same with Van Gogh as well. Um, I've been with Van Gogh for, crikey, I think it's, must be nearly 10 years now and um, they've always been a big support but I don't I don't really have much to do with Rab anymore I think um, Rab are more interested in proper mountaineers they're not really bothered about backpackers and stuff anymore I so I, I heard from them that, that they they thought you were out of their league now Terry <laughs> I doubt that mate but <laughs> I can hear anyway, someone Alex... Around there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's uh, she's just laughing in between sneezing. Uh, from Den, uh, watch, uh, what are we? Um, uh, Den, uh, sorry, I so do apologize. Alex Smith, watch you from Glasgow. Uh, Derry Silver, um, uh, join a tired yours truly with a beer in hand. So he's he's obviously watching tonight. So thanks for joining us, Derry. Um, Matt Black Gaming, uh, evening buddy. He's obviously a friend of yours. Uh, Paul Hello, from Love everybody. Audio. Paul from Love Audio uh, agreed with you when you were talking about the they'll tolerate bad video, but bad sound they certainly won't tolerate. Um, Martin Rye, another great lightweight backpacker. He said great interviews. He enjoyed enjoyed it and save the bees said evening all which is good. And a question that's come in as well is of course what next, Sir Terry? Um, Sir Terry, that's only my close friends call me that. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Um, um, I don't want to say too much, do I? It's all a oh, secret. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I'm often, I'm often somebody, I say I'm often, I am. I'm somebody that likes to let my actions, let my work do the talking. So... Because people perceive things in a way with social media, um, with my work, anybody that's involved with what I do on the documentaries, because that's just the way of the world now, isn't it? A lot of people live their lives online, and um, I'm not like that. I like to think I'm a bit more grounded, so I like to meet people face to face and weigh them up and all the rest of it and make judgments and calls from that, and that helps me form what I want to do with my next documentary of who I want to film and why, and particularly who I want to film and why. Um, so in that respect, now the social media is good, of course, because that's how a lot of people connect nowadays, especially with bloody lockdown and what have you. But um, going back to what's next, well, 
if I give a clue, if you watch the full two and a half hour version of the Helvellyn film, the clue is in the song in the credits roll. Right. I'll leave that one in the air. I'll leave that one in the air. So, of course, if you want to follow Terry, if you're not already, of course, um, he is, as he says, very active on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, all his products are available through stridingedge.com. And if you're not following us already, uh, well, I hope you are, because you're here this evening and you picked it all up, but you're obviously we're as busy as we can be on social media as well. And if you can sign up for the newsletter, it does make our life an awful lot easier trying to get hold of you. This will be going out as a podcast, so I hope people who are listening to this as a podcast have enjoyed it, and we've got 538 podcasts in the library, and this will be number 539, and once again, thanks to all those, uh, all the handful of people that have supported us on Kofi and Patreon, and all those contributors, guests, and all our newsletter members, etc, etc. So appreciate your time. So, Terry, I think we've pretty well wrapped up this evening. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Um, there is one final question which I always like to drop in, and if you've been listening to my podcast, you would have heard it, but it'll be interesting to see what the reaction is. Of all the things I could have asked you about your three films, what should I have asked you? I've no idea. I'm just a humble person. Oh, Right, well, on that humble person note, then, we will say our farewells. Thanks, everybody, that's uh, joined in. Thanks, everybody, for joined in with the questions that have watched this evening. I hope you've enjoyed the film. We've had a good audience that have stayed with us all the way through. So thanks once again, and thank you, Terry, for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. All the best now. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye, everybody.